to today's today's webinar, Empowering Nurses to Protect Themselves and Their Patients, Device Reprocessing and Sterilization. My name is Kate Wiedemann, and I'm a Health Communications Specialist at CDC's Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion. The mission of CDC's Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion is to protect patients, protect healthcare personnel, and promote safety, quality, and value in both national and international healthcare delivery systems. This webinar, webinar is part of a series of infection control related webinars that CDC will be hosting with the American Nurses Association and members of the Nursing Infection Control Education Network. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items to cover. We welcome your questions. Please submit any questions or comments you have via your chat window located on the lower left hand side of the webinar screen any time during the presentation. Questions will be addressed after all presentations as time allows. Please press the raise hand button located on the top left hand side of the screen if you need to chat with a meeting chairperson for assistance, such as technical difficulties during the webinar. Also, the speaker slides from today's presentation will be provided to participants in a follow-up email. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sean Ross from the American Nurses Association who will provide opening remarks. Dr. Ross? Thank you, Kate. My name is Dr. Sean Ross and I am the Director of Nursing Practice and Work Environment at the ANA. ANA is the premier organization representing the interests of the nation's 3.6 million registered nurses. For 120 years, ANA has advanced the nursing profession by fostering high standards of nursing practice, promoting a safe and ethical work environment, bolstering the health and wellness of nurses, and advocating on the health issues that affect nurses and the public. 15 years in a row, Gallup lists nursing as the most trusted profession. Why? According to the survey, 80% of respondents rated nursing, nurses as having a very high honesty and ethical standards. Nursing practice transcends health care settings and is a powerful unified force in engaging consumers and transforming health and health care. The world is a risky place and it's getting riskier every day. Free global movement means more people and more contact with more germs. At any given time, about one in every 25 patients has an infection related to their hospital care. Furthermore, Antibiotic resistant germs cause more than 2 million illnesses and at least 23,000 deaths annually in the United States. So the question is, what can nurses do? The chain of infection was introduced to describe the elements that must exist for infection to occur. Each link in the chain has a role in disease transmission. Removing one or more links in the chain will prevent the transmission of disease. The primary goal of infection prevention is to break the chain of infection as the front line of defense in educate, I'm sorry, in infection prevention and control. Nurses are uniquely positioned to break the chain. In June 2016, ANA was awarded a two-year contract with the CDC to enhance the education of nurses in infection prevention and control. Twenty nurses nursing specialties, state and constituent organizations are currently working on framing, disseminating, and facilitating educational programs for nurses. Today's webinar is the first webinar within the NICE Network series, Empowering Nurses to Protect Themselves and Their Patients. Five additional webinars will occur between now and March 2018. At this time, I will turn it over to Dr. Christine Philippone with the New Jersey State New Jersey State Nurses Association. Thank you, Dr. Ross. For the next few minutes, I will be discussing what nurses need to know about reprocessing, disinfection, and sterilization. Each year in the United States, there are millions of procedures performed in hospitals and outpatient centers annually. These procedures involve contact by a medical device, such as a scope or surgical instrument, with the patient's sterile tissue or mucous membrane. This contact can potentially place a patient at risk for infection if the device is not properly 
reprocessed, disinfected, or sterilized. A major risk of all procedures is the introduction, introduction of an infectious organism. Therefore, cleaning is essential before disinfection and sterilization follow. Failure to properly clean, disinfect, or sterilize equipment places our patients at risk for infection. As infectious organisms can be transferred by contaminated equipment or devices to the patient. Cleaning, followed by the use of an effective disinfectant and sterilization practice, is essential for ensuring the instruments and devices do not transmit infectious pathogens to patients. Therefore, nurses need to know what type of reprocessing is required for what type of equipment or device. Reusable medical devices, as defined by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, or the FDA, are devices that the healthcare providers can reprocess and reuse on multiple patients. Since these devices are used on multiple patients, it is imperative to properly reprocess reusable medical devices. Okay, now let's look at the reprocessing. Phase. Reprocessing is broken down into three different phases. The first and foremost is cleaning. Cleaning is defined as the removal of all foreign material from objects. This step must precede disinfection and sterilization. For disinfection and sterilization, you need to have a clean piece of equipment to have effective disinfection and sterilization. The next step is disinfection. And that is a process that eliminates many or all pathogenic microorganisms on inanimate objects with the exception of bacterial endospores. And our most common endospore known is clostridium. Lastly is the terminal stage, which is sterilization. And that's the complete elimination of all forms of, micro, uh, of microorganisms, including endospores. Years ago, Dr. Earl Spaulding divided medical devices into three different categories. These categories were based upon the risk of infection involved by the use of the device. So the first category Dr. Spaulding identified is critical devices. And these are devices that enter normally sterile tissue or the vascular system. This includes surgical instruments, needles, stents, implantable devices. The second category is entitled semi-critical devices. And these are devices that come in contact with intact mucous membranes. And typically, they do not enter or penetrate sterile tissue. Such devices are endoscopes, respiratory therapy equipment. The third category is non-critical devices. These are well known to nurses. These are devices that touch only intact skin and are commonly used by the nurse such as their stethoscope, blood pressure equipment, external thermometers. Now we know the three categories of medical devices, critical, semi-critical, and non-critical. How can we as nurses reduce the risk of exposure and protect our patients from infection? First, the nurse can prep surgical equipment after use before reprocessing and sterilization. This process will reduce the retention of blood, tissue, biodebris, which in turn decreases the survivability of microorganisms, making the decontamination process easier and more effective. Next, the prepping of equipment and medical devices can include spraying and proper containment of the device. Enzymatic cleaners are used and considered powerful all-purpose cleaners that use a protease enzyme. Upon contact with the medical device, this enzyme effectively cleans away blood, tissue, mucus, and other protein-rich body fluids. So let's take a look at the overview of reprocessing. Step one, reprocessing begins at the point of use, as soon as possible after use of the item. This step includes prompt initial cleaning steps and or measures to prevent drying of soil and contaminants such as blood and body fluids in and on the device. This is where you would use the protease cleaners. 
Step two is thorough cleaning. The device should be thoroughly, thoroughly cleaned after the point of use processing. Thorough cleaning is performed in a dedicated cleaning area. It is not performed in a hand washing sink or in a clean area, a dedicated area. Usually this area is identified in central processing as the decontamination area where proper personal protective equipment or PPE and ventilation requirements are in place. Step three, disinfection or sterilization. Depending on the intended use of the device, the device should be disinfected or sterilized. Failure to comply with evidence-based guidelines have led, numerous out led to numerous outbreaks and have placed patients at risk for infection. Remember, it is your role to advocate and protect our patients. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite uh, to introduce Brian Haradine from the American Nurses Association, California. Good morning. My name is Brian Haradine, and I'm with the Desert Regional Medical Center in Palm Springs, California, and also with the American Nurses Association in California. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about the uh, guidelines, or organizations that offer guidance for nurses in providing uh, sterilization. So the first one is the Association for the Advancement of Medical Instrumentation, otherwise known as AMI. Their guidance document, ST79, covers steam sterilization and sterility assurance. And this is one document that uh, provides a lot of guidance for nurses and other professionals dealing with uh, sterilization in the, uh, in the acute care and uh, office settings. The CDC also provides a guideline for sterilization in healthcare facilities that was put out in 2008. Furthermore, the Joint Commission uh, provides further guidance on its website on how to provide sterilization guidelines. The International Association of Hospital Central Sterile Material Management uh, has its own documents which are used worldwide in uh, providing guidance for nurses and other healthcare professionals looking to provide sterility assurance. The Association of Perioperative Registered Nurses, AORN, publishes its guidelines for perioperative practice. And this book is actually updated every year with current evidence-based practices for nurses uh, working in the OR environment and also in sterile processing environments. And finally, the Food and Drug Administration offers nine binding guidance documents to assist manufacturers seeking 510K clearance for their medical devices. The goals of recommended practices are the following, to provide a framework for the safe workflow to reprocess medical instruments, set standards for sterility assurance in the healthcare industry, offers evidence-based rationale for the practices, prevents disease transmission or healthcare-associated infections. And finally, and most importantly, is to provide, is to make sure that patients receive consistent quality patient care so that the medical procedures done at the start of the day uh, are clean and the patients coming later in the day also get the same type of care. One issue that I just wanted to uh, talk about uh, that's a little controversial right now is single-use medical device reprocessing. There's a few pros and cons about this. The pros are that uh, they produce, it produces less medical waste, provides cost-effective medical devices, and uh, they also have a strict control in place by FDA on medical device reprocessors. However, the cons against this are is that it does go against manufacturer's guidelines for use for single devices. The, the original manufacturer will no longer guarantee the product after reprocessing if it was only designed for single use. And providers and frontline staff perceive product uh, to be of inferior quality if it was designed to single use and is now being reprocessed. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to uh, Aaron McColpin. Hello, uh, Aaron McCulpin. I'm with Cal State Channel Islands Nursing and the California uh, Division of American Nursing Association. The thing I'd like to talk about is uh, policies and procedures with infection control. Uh, every organization should have policies addressing these uh, issues. There can be multiple issues associated with these policies and procedures. 
Policy and procedures are used to communicate an organization's desire, such as decreasing you know, a, a nosocomial infection, and then have a, have a plan of action to obtain a positive result, and that would be part of this uh, sterilization process. Uh, issues within organizations uh, can lead to serious consequences. These common issues often include uh, the uh, it, between nursing staff and environmental service staff who has responsibilities for the cleaning. Also, failure of a, a hospital to adopt uh, the, the adequate policies to train their staff on the policies and ensure implementation and the evaluation of the policies effectiveness. We often see that most staff have inadequate time to complete the cleaning process. Um, also, it's difficult to ensure disinfection of mobile equipment and also policies can be uh, inconsistent with standard of care or new evidence-based practices. Also, some organizations may have contradictory or differing policies within their own organizations or between departments. Hi, Erin. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. This is, this is sure. Kate Wiedemann. We're getting some, um, some chats that we're not able to hear your audio very well or some folks aren't. Could you speak up just a little bit louder? Oh, absolutely. All right, thank you. So sorry. Thanks, Rick. So some of the ways that we can uh, finally uh, address these common issues would be that uh, staff really does need to have participation with the policies and procedures as they are expected to know the policies and procedures that they are designated with the cleaning process. Some of the ways we can address these uh, common issues are standardizing policies across the healthcare system. Also, the use of electronic policy libraries to ensure all staff have access to the most current policies and procedures at any time. Also, organizations should implement a feedback mechanism so staff can report situations to management that resulted from a near miss or some time, uh, type of workaround. Again, we need to really stress to all staff that they are responsible for knowing a policy and procedure for cleaning and infection control within the organization. And all staff should also have access to their infection prevention specialist and training to support these goals. So for the evidence-based practice, there's multiple recommendations uh, that we've spoken about, about uh, using um, amazonic cleaners, cleaning first then disinfecting. One of the big things to know is the manufacturer's recommendation in terms of the disinfectant agent to clean their devices. But we won't repeat all of these evidence-based guidelines since our sister organizations have mentioned multiple uh, evidence-based practice in their presentation. Personal protective equipment must be used and it needs to be appropriate for the type of cleaning being used or sterilization. We have to ask ourselves how many nurses have had a formal course in infection control? And as we know, very few. Due to the growing frequency of anti-resistant microbial infections, Nursing, medical, and allied health schools need to address these issues in greater detail on infection prevention measures within their curriculum. Teaching students about aseptic versus sterile technique is not sufficient knowledge on infection control. And as practicing nursing, what are we doing to increase our knowledge? So we have a webinar such as this and also formal courses. Take an example from the California Dental Board. For dentists to renew their license, they have to complete at least two hours of infection control continuing education units in order to keep up with the current practices and renew their license. Finally, in developing infection control policies for your organization, use a multidisciplinary team that comply with federal, state, and local regulations, along with accreditation agencies such as the Joint Commission and standards from professional organizations such as AMI and the AORN. Doctors, nurses, physician assistants, medical assistants, and therapists all need to get involved. And we need to understand the importance of proper infection control practices when it comes to medical device reprocessing and sterilization. And I'd like to turn it over to our next speaker, uh, Marquetta. Thank you, thank you, Aaron. The federal baseline provides a regulatory framework, and this guidance document requires that third-party reprocessors and hospitals comply with all regulatory requirements of the FDA applicable to the original equipment. On federal level, legislatively, Congressman Ted Lieu introduced House Bill HR 872 in February this year, called the Device Act of 2017. 
The Device Act emphasizes that before making any changes to the design or to the reprocessing instruction of a device, the manufacturer shall give written notice of the changes to the FDA. FDA will then assess and analyze and decide if they need safety regulations. Now, in California, current bills are trying to increase infection control vigilance through various platforms, better reporting, assuring safety, using safety devices, and assuring overall safe practices. Now, Assembly Bill AB 1277 from Assemblyman Tom Daly would amend California Dental Board regulation for infection control by specifically requiring procedure water used in irrigation to be sterile. Now, on a different note, in the present moment, California hospitals are required to report infection outbreaks, but they're not penalized when they fail to do so, and these are rarely disclosed to the public. Now, the lack of transparency puts patients at a disadvantage in selecting healthcare facilities. Given how important the issue of antibiotic resistance is, California Senator Jerry Hill introduced Senate Bill SB43. This bill will establish a statewide public health surveillance system for tracking antibiotic resistance infections and will require physicians to list antimicrobial resistance as the cause mortality on the certificate. Now, why is this important? Why do we need more data? Only armed with accurate data will policy and decision makers alongside with elected officials be able to make evidence-based decisions that will assure patient protection and public safety. Now, this concludes ANAC presentation. And now I would like to uh, introduce Crystal Heishman from the National Association of Orthopedic Nurses. Good morning. Um, I'm Crystal Heishman. I'm going to talk about bio burden and the importance of instrument assembly and disassembly this morning. And to start you off with a little background, uh, a quick internet search produces numerous articles and news stories related to contamination, disinfection, and sterilization highlighting the importance of each and implications when deviations occur. And as previously mentioned, we'll go back over the Spalding classification. This is important. So the Spalding classification is a system of categorizing medical devices based on their use, contact with the body, and risk of infection involved with their use. So our critical instruments, those are instruments that are normally introduced uh, directly into the human body, and they come in contact with uh, normally sterile sites or the bloodstream. So that might be your surgical instruments, your drills, implants, things of that nature. And then we have our semi-critical devices, and those are instruments that do not normally enter sterile areas or the blood, and they just come in contact with our mucous membranes or possibly non-intact skin. So that might be your ENT scopes, um, speculums used with uh, OBGYN exams, even dental mirrors. And then our non-critical devices, and that's going to be your blood pressure cuffs, your stethoscopes, things that are touching intact skin or just environmental services. It's also important to understand what bio-burden is. So bio burden is the number of viable organisms that are found in or on an object or surface. And they might be known as microbial load or a bio load. And they're measured in colony forming units. And then when we um, clean those, those pieces of equipment or sterilize or high level disinfect, the elimination of those is shown as a log reduction, which is logarithm and it goes in exponents of 10. And in order to get those reductions in the bio burden, um, we have to clean. So the very basic step of everything with sterilization and disinfection is cleaning or the mechanical removal of dirt or foreign materials. Um, disinfection, so that's going to be your elimination or destruction of almost everything on a surface or item except for um, some endospores. 
uh, such as mentioned before with Clostridium difficile. And then we have those divided into three different categories. So we have high-level disinfection, that's going to be for your endoscopes and, and things of that nature. We have intermediate. With intermediate uh, disinfection, you might see that with your Clostridium difficile rooms, just even using your bleach wipes. And then your low-level disinfection, which is just your normal surfaces and, and cleaning with your normal EPA-approved hospital disinfectant. And then we have sterilization, and that's the elimination or destruction of all living organisms on a surface or item. And now that we have that uh, important background, I'm going to turn it over to Mark, and he's going to talk about assembly and disassembly. Thank you, Crystal. As we talk about bio-burden and the importance of instrument assembly and disassembly, we know to get rid of bio-burden, cleaning, decontamination, and rinsing are critical, critical, and users must follow and complete all required processing steps regardless of the sterilization exposure parameters being used. The device manufacturer's written instructions for use, or IFUs, must be followed. So in other words, we're looking to the experts in cleaning and decon decontamination of instruments, and that, of course, is the manufacturer. Because they've done the testing and validation of sterilization and what steps it takes to achieve cleanliness. So having access to the IFU are critical. Decontamination starts at the point of use, meaning in surgery or by the bedside. This is done by removing soil, blood, body fat, and other substances. If not done at the point of use, this can cause soil and blood to dry on the instruments, making it more difficult to clean. But the next step in decontamination is when we must disassemble and thoroughly clean the instruments with detergent and water. But to do this, we need to make sure that our decontamination area is set up appropriately. Our decontamination area that the facility must consider should be separate from other areas with floors, walls, ceiling, and work surfaces made of non-porous materials to withstand frequent cleaning and wet conditions. Decontamination areas should have a minimum of 10 air exchanges, negative airflow, and be exhausted outdoors without recirculation. Temperatures should be maintained between 60 and 65 degrees Fahrenheit. In the decontamination area, personal protective equipment, or PPE, is important not only to protect the staff but also to help prevent introducing more bio-burden onto the instruments. PPE consists of hair covering, a face mask with plastic eye shield, liquid resistant covering or an apron, gloves, scrubs that are provided by the hospital, and shoe covers. If you look at this photo, which is an older photo, you can see that we are still continuing to improve the things that we do. We now make sure that the hair is completely covered by using bonnet type hair covers. One of the areas that we need to pay attention to is our lumens. Lumens are brushed and flushed underwater with a cleaning solution and rinsed thoroughly. Lumens are particularly difficult to clean and also difficult to sterilize. It's important to consult the device manufacturer for important regard, importance information regarding the proper detergent, brush type, brush size, and rinse procedures, meaning either treated or untreated water. Disassembly of instruments are another area of concern. <clears throat> Many IFUs require instruments to be taken apart to thoroughly clean the instrument. 
If this is not followed, bio-burden and cross-contaminants will remain on the instrument, possibly causing a transfer of these contaminants to a patient. We look at laparoscopic instruments as an example. They look simple to clean, but upon further inspection, there are many pieces and parts to clean. So not knowing the instruments can cause that cross-contamination we talk about. Also, on a financial note, not cleaning the instrument properly will shorten the life of the instrument in addition to putting the patient at risk. Now I would like to, to present to you Sharon Van Wilken with the Association of Perioperative Registered Nurses. Thank you, Mark, and thank you all for giving me the opportunity to be a part of today's uh, webinar. My assigned topic is to provide a summary of best practices for processing flexible endoscopes. The objective for this session is to discuss evidence-based practices for processing flexible endoscopes. And it just so happens that AORN has recently updated its guideline for processing flexible endoscopes. And I had the enormous privilege of being the lead author of that document. So during today's session, I'm going to talk very briefly about each of the processing steps so that you have a really good idea of what is involved in processing a flexible endoscope and what kinds of things you should be looking for in an audit or a review of your processing procedures. The first step in processing a flexible endoscope is to pre-clean the device at the point of use. Pre-cleaning should occur as soon as possible after the endoscope is removed from the patient uh, or the procedure is completed and before organic material has had an opportunity uh, to dry on the surface or in the channels of the endoscope. After pre-cleaning at the point of use, the contaminated endoscope and its accessories should be transported to the endoscopy processing room. Uh, contaminated endoscopes must be transported to the decontamination area in a closed container or a closed transport cart. And that cart or container must be leak proof, puncture resistant, and large enough to contain all of the contents. And it must also be labeled with a biohazard legend. Now your processing should begin as soon as possible after the device has been transported to the endoscopy processing room within the manufacturer's recommended time to processing. And when it's not possible to initiate that cleaning process within the endoscope manufacturer's recommended time to cleaning, then the manufacturer's instructions for use for delayed processing should be followed. Flexible endoscopes that are designed to be leak tested should be leak tested. And they should be leak tested after each use and after any event that may have damaged the endoscope. Leak testing should be performed before manual cleaning and before the endoscope is placed into any kind of cleaning solutions. Now the evidence fully supports leak testing because this gives us a method to help ensure that the endoscope has not been compromised and that it is safe to use on the patient. Leak testing detects openings in the external surfaces and the internal channels of the endoscope that could permit water or chemicals or organic material to enter portions of the endoscope that are not intended for those materials. And these materials and fluids can accumulate in the endoscope from the time the integrity of the endoscope has been breached until the time that the leak is identified. After leak testing, endoscopes should be manually cleaned. And the evidence tells us that this manual cleaning step is the most important step in processing flexible endoscopes. And this just makes sense. Uh, because of the body cavities that they enter, some flexible endoscopes acquire very high levels of microbial contamination. And the environment in which we use our flexible endoscopes provides optimal conditions for contamination and for growth of biofilm. When endoscopes are effectively cleaned, that bio-burden is reduced to a level that does not present a challenge to the subsequent high-level disinfection or sterilization process. 
After manual cleaning, flexible endoscopes and their accessories should be inspected for cleanliness and for damage. And we recommend that this inspection takes place using lighted magnification so you can see what you're looking at. You can inspect the internal channels of flexible endoscopes using an endoscopic camera or a boroscope. AORN recommends that manual cleaning and inspection of flexible endoscopes is verified using cleaning verification tests at established intervals such as after each use or once daily and also whenever new endoscopes are purchased. Your cleaning verification tests uh, include adenosine triphosphate or ATP, and there are also chemical reagent tests available for detecting clinically relevant soils such as protein or carbohydrates. Periodic verification of the cleaning effectiveness can help to reduce errors in manual cleaning and improve the effectiveness of cleaning. After manual cleaning and when it is compatible with the endoscope manufacturer's instructions for use, your flexible endoscopes and accessories should be either mechanically cleaned and mechanically processed by exposure to a high-level disinfectant or a liquid chemical sterilant, or they should be mechanically cleaned and sterilized. And the evidence is very, very clear on this. It tells us that mechanical processing is far superior to manual soaking. Mechanical processing improves cleaning effect. It increases efficiency. It minimizes personnel exposure to chemicals and biohazardous materials. And it can be much more successfully monitored for quality and consistency uh, in the uh, disinfection process. Now, following disinfection or liquid chemical sterilization, uh, the endoscope and its channel should be mechanically rinsed and flushed with either critical or sterile water. We recommend that a multidisciplinary team conduct a risk assessment to determine whether your endoscope lumen should be flushed with 70 to 90 percent ethyl or isopropyl alcohol. Uh, many clinical practice guidelines and many experts in the field recommend manual or mechanical flushing of the endoscope lumens with alcohol because it helps to facilitate drying of the endoscope lumens by binding with residual water, and this enhances evaporation. However, flushing of the endoscope lumens with alcohol just might not be necessary if your endoscope has been effectively cleaned and thoroughly dried. And because of the fixative properties of alcohol, this practice is not recommended in many countries. After mechanical processing, the exterior surfaces of the endoscope should be dried with a soft, lint-free cloth or a sponge, and the endoscope channel should be dried by purging with instrument air, or they can be mechanically dried with a mechanical processor drying system. And again, the evidence tells us that effectively drying the internal and the external surfaces of the endoscope might just be as important as effective cleaning and disinfection or sterilization. So the point to remember is that our endoscopes need to be first meticulously, scrupulously, immaculately clean, and second, they need to be dry, as in bone dry, without a trace of moisture, just like an old weathered bone in the desert. AORN recommends that your process flexible endoscopes are stored in a drying cabinet. And again, the collective evidence tells us that optimal storage of flexible endoscopes provides protection from environmental contaminants. Now, drying cabinets include a drying system that circulates HEPA-filtered air through the cabinet, while filtered air under pressure is also forced continuously through those endoscope channels. So the internal and the external surfaces of the endoscope are being continuously dried, and this will suppress bacterial growth. Now, if a drying cabinet is not available, then your flexible endoscopes can be stored in a closed cabinet with HEPA filtered air that provides positive pressure within the cabinet and allows air circulation around the flexible endoscope. 
Now the evidence regarding the maximum safe storage time uh, for processed endoscopes is inconclusive, and we looked at uh, recommendations from professional organizations and found that the maximum storage times uh, recommended by these organizations were not in agreement, and they ranged anywhere from three hours to one month. We also looked at recommendations from research studies and found that they also were not in agreement and that they showed that when correctly processed, endoscopes could be safe to use for anywhere from 48 hours to 56 days after processing. What we know is that safe storage times are affected by variables that are unique to the facility, uh, such as the type of endoscopes that you're using, uh, the processing effectiveness, the compliance with the manufacturer's instructions, uh, the storage conditions, the frequency that your endoscopes are used, and of course, your own patient population. And since these uh, factors and other relevant variables differ from facility to facility, then a policy that defines the maximum safe storage time is really best developed and established by a multidisciplinary team from within the facility. Uh, however, we have provided an extensive evidence review to help the team make this very important decision. Thank you so much for your attention, and thank you for the work that you do every day to keep our patients safe. This is the reference for the AORN guideline for processing flexible endoscopes, where you will find all of the information and the evidence to support each of the recommendations we've discussed today. And at this time, I'm happy to turn the presentation uh, back to Dr. Ross from the American Nurses Association. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, so now is the question and answer um, portion of the webinar. The first question comes from Crystal Martinez, and the question is, as far as the CDC awarded funding for educate, educating nurses on their role for infection prevention, how is this being implemented within accredited nursing schools to better prepare new nurses and experienced nurses? It seems that many experienced nurses feel that because they are exposed to many resistant organisms in their work environment on a daily basis, they become somehow apathetic in their practice, which places patients at risk. So Crystal, we have partnered, part of our um, NICE network, we have partnered with two organizations um, that specifically focus on nursing students, um, and those organizations are the American Association of Colleges of Nurses and the National Student Nurses Association. And those two organizations um, are working to provide information to various nursing schools at their um, upcoming conferences and um, to change curriculums over time. Um, the next question comes from Crystal Overbeck. And the question is, we do not use an enzymatic at the point of use, but a surfactant. Is this acceptable? So I'm going to hand it over to the New Jersey Nurses Association, uh, Christine. Can you answer that question for us? Yeah, so you can use an enzymatic or a surfactant, or you can just keep the device covered with a moist um, towel until we can decontaminate it. It really depends on the time frame when we last used the piece of equipment to the decontamination process. The goal is not to have any of the blood and body fluid stick or retain on the instrument. We need to make sure we can decontaminate that effectively and efficiently. Thanks, Christine. I have three more questions for you. Um, the next question comes from Loriano Marcos. Can we clean a consumable labeled with single use in the package? For example, syringes used for dissolved medication aspiration or nebulizer kit used by one patient only or a yanker. What's your advice about this? A single use should be used for one time use only. Thanks, Christine. And uh, the next question from John is, ARN for equipment non-scope states that states to keep things moist, no mention of enzymatics. There seems to be a lot of confusion surrounding the use of enzymatics in which they are sprayed and then left to sit to dry. We are attempting to focus more on keeping the items moist in the container via high humidity versus relying solely on enzymatics.
Can you provide any further clarification? No, I think Hi. Go ahead. This is Sharon from AORN. Um, yes, we do recommend that instruments are kept moist uh, after they are used. And enzymatic sprays uh, or gels and foams are not designed to be uh, applied to the device and then the device is left to sit to dry. So this would be a point where you would want to be sure to follow the manufacturer's instructions for use uh, provided with those um, you know, those products. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for ANA California. The question comes from Tara Spruhill. Um, wondering if you see a lot of single-use only items being reprocessed and examples of items you have seen being reprocessed. This is Brian with ANA California and Desert Regional Medical Center in Palm Springs. I can answer that question. Uh, Types of things that I see reprocessed in the operating room a lot that were labeled uh, uh, single use uh, tend to be uh, things that are used for uh, electric coagulation um, and, uh, and, other, and, some, and also uh, for delivering surgical staples. So those are some of the types, I think, uh, types of things that I've, been, I've most often seen reprocessed. Thanks, Brian. I have about three more questions for ANA California. Brenda asks, uh, I think it would, I think that there is a greater legal risk to the nurse if they reuse a product where the manufacturer designed the item to be used only once. Are you aware of any cases where there have been a negative issue from using a single-use item more than once? And if so, were there any legal issues because of it? A lot of the legal issues that, I, that I've come across in my research have been about where, um, where it was not reprocessed properly, uh, either and uh, usually the medical centers may have taken it upon themselves to reprocess it themselves, which is not correct um, unless they've been uh, designated a medical device reprocessor. So uh, usually those are the legal issues that I've seen. Um, there's been some other cases where um, uh, people have gone after the reprocessors, but I don't, and I don't know the outcomes of those cases. Thanks. Um, one more question. Are you saying that these policies should be owned by infection prevention instead of SPD? Hello, this is uh, Aaron from uh, ANA California. Uh, that's kind of a tricky question. So a lot of times this has to do with the policy is with uh, the actual department, but it has to have oversight with infection control. So that's usually one of the major issues between is you get differing policies based on who writes it. So sometimes reprocessing will have a separate uh, policy and then infection control may have a little bit different policy and that's why you have to have this multidisciplinary team approach because often uh, the department's development but it should be in accordance with the infection control specialist. Okay, thank you. Uh, could you, again for ANA California, could you address the final rinse with distilled water versus using a filter built into the faucet? Um, this is Marqueta and uh, ANA California, and I believe that this question goes to the AB 1277, which is uh, a current bill in the California capital. So the bill would mandate uh, that California Board of Dentistry will change the regulation to require sterile water to be used for irrigation to be dealing with the dental pump. Uh, it is currently uh, being heard in uh, 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 um, Senate Appropriation Committee. So until it becomes a law, so far current regulation stands. Thank you. Uh, the next question is um, for AORN. We use the EvoTech automatic washer that leak tests and cleans the entire scope without brushing. We wipe the outside of the scope down and place the e and place in the EvoTech. Are you familiar with this reprocessor? These reprocessors do not require the manual brushing before placement in the unit. 
Yes, um, I am familiar with that. And in fact, there was a, a really uh, well done study by Dr. Michelle Alpha, uh, who's very renowned for her research, research on flexible endoscopes. And she tested uh, that device and found that it was as effective uh, with uh, eliminating the manual cleaning step. Uh, and in our recommendation, uh, in our guidelines for uh, processing flexible endoscopes, we do say that if the manufacturer has uh, been FDA cleared for uh, eliminating the manual cleaning step uh, in their reprocessor, that that's fun to do that. Thank you. The next three questions are for the National Association of Orthopedic Nurses. The first question is, would you please give us the reference for the air exchange and temp requirements in the decontamination room? Yeah, hi, this is Mark Finch. So that's under the AMI standard 3.3.64 uh, under AMI standard um, 79. This is Sharon Another from Warren. Standards actually come from the American Society for Healthcare Engineering. Those are the folks that develop those standards, and organizations such as Amy and AORN uh, do repeat them in their guidelines. Thank you. The next question, uh, please include the proper PPE throughout the process of cleaning to sterilization of equipment. I'm not sure. I think in the when uh, the slides are distributed, they'll they'll add that to it. I'm not sure if we can answer that uh, via webinar at this point. Um, and the last question is, what is meant by treated water versus untreated water? So untreated water would be the tap water, and treated water be, would be like your ORI system, R O I system, your reverse osmosis. Okay. Um, other questions are, if we are doing ATP on all ERCP scopes in a random, in random 10 scopes every month, is this, re is this meeting the requirement for testing? Yes, uh, this is Sharon from AORN. Yes, that would meet the requirement for testing because there actually is no requirement for testing. So you basically want to look at how many scopes you're using uh, and, and, and determine what a reasonable uh, number of scopes to be tested would be. And that's why our, our guidelines say on an established uh, schedule because we, you know, each facility is different in the amount of scopes they have and the amount of scopes that are processed. Uh, each day, and so uh, some facilities might need to um, do that testing uh, once daily. Other facilities once a week might be just fine. So it sounds to me like you're doing a good job. Uh, and the last two questions, um, can you uh, apply the hang time for endoscopes to all scopes and probes? This is Sharon from AOR, and again, uh, yes, you can. Um, our guideline for processing uh, flexible endoscopes, we actually state in there that it is not only for endoscopes, it's for all, uh, for GI endoscopes, it's for all types of endoscopes, including um, ultrasound probes and TEE probes and that kind of thing. So yes, you can apply the same hang time, but you would want to determine that hang time based on a multidisciplinary team decision from within your facility, and you'd want to be looking at uh, things like storage conditions and your patient population and how compliant you are with uh, the manufacturer's recommendations for processing, uh, and take all of that into consideration, plus a review of the evidence which we've provided when you make that decision. And the last question is, uh, what are your thoughts on the use of HumiPack uh, humi for ambulatory primary care settings that do not have the appropriate ventilation or decontamination areas? This is Sharon from AORN. So I have not 
actually seen a, a Humi pack. I'm gathering it's a device that is designed to um, bring the humidity into compliance. Um, this is a problem that facilities across the country struggle with. Um, the recommended humidity uh, is between 20 to 20 to 60 percent. Um, and there are facilities in very dry areas. I'm in Denver, and we're very, very dry. So achieving that 20% humidity is very difficult. And there are certain um, products that have to be stored uh, at at a 30% humidity. So um, so it can be very difficult to achieve that. And you would need to work with your um, engineering experts, your plant maintenance experts to help you achieve those um, recommended parameters as much as you possibly can. Uh, I can't speak to a HemiPAC specifically because I've not seen it. Hi, this is Mark Finch. Um, a HemiPAC I believe is a, is what is being referred to is a peel pack substance that you um, can inject uh, sterile or clean water into um, and be sealed so that it keeps the blood and soil uh, moist, especially if you're going to be in an ambulatory type situation or an ER where the instruments cannot be gotten to for, you know, I believe it's up to 72 hours, and so it keeps everything moist. Um, so if that's what they're referring to, um, I have used those in the past but they're more for just keeping stuff moist to get to the um, till it can get to de decontamination. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this concludes the question and answer portion of this webinar. Um, thanks to all who submitted questions. I'm going to hand it back over to Kate. Thank you so much, Dr. Ross, and thank you to all of our speakers today for a really wonderful presentation. Um, so today, before we end the webinar, um, I want to provide some instructions for receiving continuing education. Um, so to receive continuing education, you must complete the continuing education post-test and evaluation. Please follow the detailed instructions that will appear on the post-meeting webpage right after you close out of this webinar. You must complete and pass the post-test activity at 75% to receive continuing education. For those on the phone who currently aren't logged into the ReadyTalk online platform, to obtain continuing education, please go to www.cdc.gov backslash TCE online. The access code for this webinar is DPS. 0712. And a follow-up email will be sent out after this webinar with detailed instructions about completing the continuing education post-test and evaluation as well. With that, I'd like to thank our speakers as well as all of you for taking the time to join us today and for your commitment to keeping your patients safe. Thank you very much.